Welcome to our panel today on the topic of inclusivity, accessibility, and equality in immersive media spaces. I'm Natalie DeMonte, Associate Director of CFC Media Lab and Managing Director of Fifth Wave based in Toronto. Fifth Wave is our newest program offering as of January of 2020, which is Canada's first radically inclusive feminist business accelerator program for women owned businesses in digital media. What we're doing is we're weaving feminist ideals of equity and fairness into traditional business practices for women and women identified folks in the digital media space. This is a new thing in the world of business. What has informed our programming for Fifth Wave moving forward is our experience running Idea Boost, a more traditional based business accelerator for tech startups in the digital media and entertainment space, which has been running for over eight years. We've always been future focused on new technology, looking at how it disrupts industries and in particular how new spaces are being shaped, not just technologically, but socially as well. So we're in a, we find ourselves in a different reality now, right? A year ago, we would have been together in a building for VRTO. Now we're sort of opposite ends of the north of the, con of the continent. Um, in a, in a virtual togetherness, right? Um, so the pandemic has altered our togetherness for probably the long term. In addition to that, technology is embedding smart interactive virtualization layers on top of our world. And so immersive media not only becomes the next sort of computing platform or new frontier, but the future of everything. Right, because when walking through public spaces for entertainment, for wellness, VR for empathy training, all those, all those types of things, the list is growing. And so we're here to talk about what that looks like. We're also here to talk about what that will feel like. I mean, it's still early days. And asking ourselves as early adopters and creators in this space, what are we doing to ensure an inclusive and equitable future in immersive media. So as we race towards this next phase of our reality, how are we avoiding the pitfalls? Um, so with me today, I have four women here to unpack that discussion further. Three of them are feminist business owners in digital media and fifth wave members based in Toronto. And I will just quickly introduce them. Gaddy Conti-George, co-founder of Oya Media Group. Raise your hand, Gaddy. <laughs> Emma Lopez, creative director of Ava Animation. And Laura Lee Sheehan, create, chief creative officer of Digital 55. The, our fourth guest is a friend of the CFC and an important collaborator of ours. She is based in LA. She has also been a part of an earlier session, leading an earlier session of the RTO and has graciously agreed to come back to join us for this discussion today, Christina Heller, CEO of Metastage. So welcome all of you. So I'll start off by just asking you individually and um, we'll start, I'll just do the roll call for you. Can you share what your company does and why you chose to start it? And I'll start with Laura Lee. Perfect, first up. Um, so uh, Chief Creative Officer of Digital 55, and we're an experience design company that works on interactive experiences um, and digital learning products. So um, we do a lot of, we use a lot of research design and development frameworks uh, to build modular experiences in order to provide access uh, to sort of education and equity issues. Um, we're really focused on content and subject matter. Um, and the purpose thing is really, really important to us in terms of um, just being able to build modular experiences that are accessible to people and that do connect with people in terms of critical thinking and those 21st century skills that um, you know, everybody's trying to build into their, their practices and their thinking. Great, thank you. Um, Gaddy, you next. So um, Oya Media Group, we're a, a black woman led uh, production company uh, here in Toronto. Um, we uh, create work in film, television and virtual reality, um, mostly documentary work. All of our um, content definitely um, addresses social issues, um, socially re relevant content, 
content um, and uh, trying to highlight um, the Black experience. We also run an emerging filmmakers program for um, postgraduate uh, Black youth to give them a pathway into the industry. Great, Christina. Hi, uh, I'm Christina Heller and I'm the CEO of MetaStage. We are a volumetric video or volumetric capture facility uh, based in Los Angeles. We use 106 cameras facing inward uh, at a performer or performers like a globe. And we capture that performance from every possible angle to get a fully 3D, but also fully authentic digital asset of whatever tra transpired live on stage. And you can then put those into augmented or virtual reality experiences and increasingly also in virtual production environments. So basically anything where you would use a game engine. Um, and it's just a great to be on this panel. I think this is a super important issue and I'm, I'm grateful to be able to discuss. Thanks. Last but not least, Emma. Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a partner and creative director at Ab Animation and Visual Arts. Um, we are an animation studio that specializes in creating extraordinary visual experiences uh, and solutions for brands, events, government agencies, and people who want to bring joy and engage communities through art, life, technology, creativity, and storytelling. And we started in 2010 because our, our goal has always been to deliver joy to these experiences and visual journeys because we believe that art can transform spaces and reactivate economies. So we want to engage communities with art, providing safe public experiences and spaces where people can be represented. Thank you. Fantastic. So four different perspectives, four different types of companies, um, in digital media, all in immersive media. Um, so I want to ask more individualized questions. So Gaddy. Oh yeah, Media Group, you guys have been creating award-winning content that uncovers incredible stories, inspirational stories, and uncovers some hard conversations too. You're also now creating VR content. So how do you approach what stories you want to work on and how will they come to light? Um, we definitely, it's, it always centers around the, sto the story. Um, so we're looking for uh, great stories that are um, that are layered, that are conversation sparkers, um, that um, work to bring around, bring about uh, social change, um, justice, debunking stereotypes, dismantling white supremacy, patriarchy, decolonizing um, uh, uh, just systems in our society. Um, stories that tap into um, I think the perspectives that um, we have from our own lived experiences are also um, stories that we're drawn to. Um, and um, so for us, it's the, those things are key or, you know, some of it, I mean, that might not be the, the main topic, but just as long as um, some of those issues are kind of swirling around a story, then those are the kind of stories that we are definitely um, attracted to. Okay. And so, in the virtual reality space as a as a relatively new medium um what you're talking about conversation starters you know social social change um dismantling power structures what barriers are you up against in ensuring in this new medium and ensuring that the important stories are seen what needs to change now um i think it's um it's I don't know if it's controversial to say, but it's like I, what I find in this uh, virtual reality space and in the 360 video space is I really question um, who who's taking the lead of telling these stories. Um, and because um, I found a lot of the stories that are being told um, aren't centered around the, um, the, the subject matter, but are from the perspective of the storyteller, which might not have the um, shared experience or the, the the lived experience that the um, the subject of the story might be around, um, and so I think that's something that has plagued and I think has you know in the film in the traditional linear film industry, something that has plagued that industry for many years and is starting to be um, seen um, as not okay. And like to be quite blunt, I find in Canada now 
um, and just internationally, especially like indigenous stories are told by indigenous storytellers. For um, other marginalized groups, I don't feel like that that's happening or happening often enough, or those stories um, are truly being centered around those communities and people who have an understanding of those communities to tell those stories um, as authentic as possible. And I think that's something that um, this industry um, uh, needs to, to look at and needs to um, address and, and um, work towards allowing others to lead and um, really questioning, you know, are you the right person to tell these stories? So do you see, just a quick follow-up question, do, do you see um, immersive media, in particular VR, um, as potentially a tool to, like an, like, an, like an empathy teaching tool to tell those stories from those perspectives? Is that how you view it? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think just the um, opportunity to have embodiment, um, I think right now is, can be such a valuable tool, especially with what's happening in the world right now. Um, if used in the right way, bringing together the right people um, and allowing, and to really questioning, you know, who who's centered in this experience and who yeah. we want to be centered in this experience, I think is just like a very crucial question um, that could really, um, I think, create great change and um, just um, getting people to really um, have um, a deeper understanding of, of, of these issues. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Laura Lee, your company builds interactive experiences like you talked about modular experiences and digital learning products. Um, using research design and development frameworks, we focus on modular experience that provide access to knowledge and support equity issues. What insights have you uncovered about developing interactive experiences that you feel are must-haves in design to ensure that they are accessible? Yeah, totally. Um, and some of this really um, sort of hops off of uh, what Gaddy was saying too, in terms of some of the storytelling pieces. A modular is key, so we call it stacked in terms of stacked tech and also stacked content um, design. So you know, people learn in different ways, and people digest content and the storytelling in terms of building an empathy or being able to tell stories um, from, you know, that uh, sort of multiplicity of voice perspective. Um, you know, you really have to think about the deployment and what that means for the content and for the learning. So we really take a learning angle in terms of, um, we kind of believe everything is a learning experience, whether it's um, in VR or you're on Spotify looking for something, can I say Spotify on here? <laughs> um, you know, whatever you're doing online and in the digital space and in a stacked digital sort of experience, you are going to be learning stuff. And I feel like we do have a great responsibility to think about content and complex storytelling as learning. So that's um, just sort of one of the first things is like people might get something specific out of a video, they might get something specific out of a VR experience, they might get something specific out of being able to explore and scroll on a website. So just really thinking about different ways that you can present the content, I think is really important for inclusive and accessible design. Um, the other thing about inclusive design is the collaboration aspect in terms of how you're breaking down that content and then how you're telling that. So um, again, it's you know looking at your team and the multiplicity of voices and the different perspectives that you can um, sort of build together so that um, it is really accessible to people from, and you can meet people where they are in terms of understanding, um, but also having your team understand sort of that humanistic perspective that across the spectrum and knowing that it is really important to not silo the way that you're, you know, uh, putting together content, but being really, really inclusive in terms of what even that collaboration is to build the content and to build that storytelling. So those are sort of the two angles that we come from in terms of inclusive design. And so how do you go about it? Like when you are trying to layer in that inclusivity, do you, um, do you kind of tell the story first, design the content first, and then layer it in? Do you do you get your your diverse members of your team to uh, to input? Like how how do the inputs affect the outputs of your content? Yeah, totally. I mean, um, it sort of it differs based on subject matter. Um, so we really do um, sort of look at team building in terms of um, putting together expertise and also doing a lot of research. Like it's never just you know, we'll start with source content, but you really do have to dive into that and make sure that you're willing to spend the time to tell that story or, um, you know, 
uh, deploy that content meaningfully. So we do really focus on research um, and making sure that the talent on the team can can be able to uh, disseminate that content in a way that's meaningful. So um, because yeah, that's where everything starts. So we always say like um, design starts from content design onwards. Like sometimes people think design is that thing that makes things look pretty at the end, but design starts from the very beginning and that, and that is designing sort of from the moment you have content, you are designing that experience and building it together. So um, that's sort of how we look at that in terms of, um, and then that does define our output. So um, yeah, we're just always thinking like that in terms of making sure that we have the voices that we need um, and also understanding that we might not know what those voices are and we have to do the research to make sure that we do understand what those voices are. Okay, thanks. Emma, so Im immerse, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> your stories are in a way a little bit different because there, it, it doesn't require any sort of special technology for the end user. It doesn't require headsets. It doesn't require anything. It just requires you to be there, you to take in the art form, which is created through projection mapping. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still things to consider when developing your projection mapped experiences that ensure that they bring, like what you always say, they bring joy and resonate with people and are able to be seen um, by as many people as possible. So how do you design for this and what are some important considerations for you? Well, the thing about joy is that it's an emotion that transcends cultural boundaries. So it's, it becomes a collective human experience because studies have identified that there are certain colors, shapes, and patterns that are considered universally joyful. No? So we do take this into consideration when we design a project. Joy becomes the main intent behind every story we tell, every work that we produce. Now, to make the content really resonate with an audience, it has to speak directly to them. They have to feel seen and represented, and this comes with as Laura Lee mentioned, extensive research and thoughtful design. We need to find out what is the story, what is the story behind this specific building, what important events are, this, are celebrated in this community, uh, what is this neighborhood famous for, what colors, shapes, and patterns represent the communities that live here, and most importantly, how do I represent their cultural background, heritage, and traditions without falling into cultural appropriation? How do I celebrate the, the diversity or uniqueness that makes them who they are? So uh, as Ngadi was saying, it's very important not only to consider our own point of view or cultural background, like we have to be able to be sensible enough to uh, see that there are many perspectives and how do we represent them in, an, in a true and respectful way? How do we celebrate them? Mm -hmm. So now in this new reality, in this new normal, um, how, has, how has your methodology evolved? I think that um, creating spaces for joy is now more important than ever. We are currently facing isolation and uncertainty on a daily basis. Like joy is not only highly beneficial for our mental health, but also has the power of creating these community experiences and remind us of our shared humanity. So usually most public art initiatives happen at the downtown core, no? They deprive citizens in suburban neighborhoods of participation and engagement opportunities. And now this is even worse, no? So our current reality, it, and it requires safety measures, really highlight the need to innovate and create safe outdoor community experience that encourage people to gradually go outside. So I believe that large format projections are ideal right now because they allow for non-invasive artistic interventions. They turn architectural landmarks into canvas for everyone, like local artists can like even represent themselves in their communities there, no? That they provide public art experiences while complying with safe distance restrictions because it's a large format. If you do it like in front of a park, people have a chance to spread out and, and, and enjoy it. No? And they include storytelling components that foster community engagement 
and promote local tourism and preserve local culture and history because shared experiences can make us feel connected even though we can't physically connect. I love the notion of the, the non-invasive, um, you know, artistic expression in, in safe distances. <laughs> Okay, so over to you, Christina. So volumetric video capture, that's a, a relatively new thing. Most people here at VRTO know exactly what that's about, but out there in the world, a lot of people don't know what that is yet. Um, but it can be used for existing stories and development as well as to ensure diverse people with diverse backgrounds and perspectives are integrated into new forms of storytelling. And so at MetaStage, at your company, um, as a female leader in the XR industry, how do you support inclusivity, accessibility, and equality? Well, I think we can do, we do it in a couple of ways. And in some ways there are, there are areas I can, we, I can control and other things that I can't control. Um, you know, the things I can control are is, you know, when, when you're hiring and that, and in our case, that's not just employees, but also the many day players that, you know, work on our various productions, you know, hiring with an eye towards a balanced and diverse team is just good business. You know, um, it allows not only, it just allows for the kinds of perspectives as other people have said that always make a project richer and stronger. So, you know, we always look for that when we're, when we're hiring. Um, additionally, you know, whenever MetaStage is doing any kind of original content, you know, I make a point to always try to approach it with the, the lens of it, making it as diverse as possible. So, you know, if you look at, for instance, uh, we we recently published a library of stock assets to the Unity store. Um, this is the idea of like background actors for VR and AR projects. Uh, th this doesn't really exist actually yet. And so we're starting to build out, you know, a library in the hopes of um, building kind of this, this whole new stock asset medium of volumetric performances, real people engaging in just everyday behavior. So someone standing there kind of standing and listening and someone standing and talking, someone sitting and listening, someone giving a presentation. And these are, I, either you can, you can honestly, they're, they're meant for game engine developers to just download and play with. And we've made them um, really affordable. So anybody anywhere can get their hands on volumetric assets and begin to experiment. That being said, like as we were bringing in real actors from Los Angeles to to build this library, like diversity was right at the front of our minds, and not just not just um, uh, gender and racial diversity, but body diversity too. You know, and um, and so and and all of our projects, you know, that that's that's the lens we approach it with. If we're working with clients, you know, we have we, that's where I'm a little more out of control. You know, if we're being contracted to provide volumetric services, you know, I, I'm not going to interfere with uh, our clients' creative. That being said, if they do ask for our opinion, and you know, it's an overwhelmingly white cast or something like that, I, you know, I will certainly let them know what I think about that. But I'll also say that I think that from at least the projects that have gone through Meta Stages. Uh, um, door there's we've ha we've captured you know a huge range of diverse um pr subjects and it does seem that at least the clients that we've had the privilege of working with are pretty savvy when it comes to you know making content for this for the next generation okay great um so for for all of you um i just want to ask this this question for all panelists um what do you think some immersive storytellers don't always consider when developing their experiences? So what's missing? Um, what should be standards and productions to help make the world a better place? And whoever wants to answer first can go. I'll go first. Um, I feel like, uh, yeah, there's just been, uh, you know, all the all the thinking and it, it's great to see sort of like the cross sectional intersectional um, thinking um, and I think some of that ties into my answer on this in terms of um, I think entertainment and media, you know, people are digesting content so much like so much content I think it's sort of it's not entertainment anymore it's really edutainment and I do think that we all have a responsibility to think about the complex topics and think about the human experiences and really tell those stories and you know people are gaining critical thinking skills and people are gaining like information literacy through this and 
uh, communication and collaboration and but the diversity piece and the inclusivity piece like um so for me i'm like i think that we can't think of things as just entertainment anymore and in digital and any of these experiences we do have to actually think about the knowledge that we're passing along and what that means for um, our audiences so for me edutainment is sort of the key thing in terms of from the beginning thinking about what that is like what is the learning and what does that mean in terms of what people are getting out of it yeah you're right. I think I agree. I mean, there's so much content being digested at such a rapid rate now that how can it not shape us um, both from, um, you know, shape us as as we socially interact with each other, too. So there's um, there's a lot to consider there. So anyone else want to comment on Emma? Yes, I think it uh, it can no longer focus on our sole experiences. We have, when we create content, we have to consider like other points of view, but also we have to question ourselves. Like how are we representing women in this content that we're creating? How are we representing minorities in this content? What's the intent? Like what are the values? Like everything we do has to be aligned like with, with the, our company, what we consider important, and we have to take into consideration what messages we are sending out there, because as Laura Lee mentioned, we are also playing a part in education. The new currency is like people's attention. We are all behind screens right now. Yeah. Gaddy, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna say for um, when it comes to the creations, I think um, a lot of um, creators now should be thinking about co-creation um, when you're doing stories um, outside of your own experience um, and co-creation at every stage of production. And that might be um, involving, you know, maybe elders from that community or using them as consultants, share, sharing with them how the production works or how the experience works so they understand the process and they understand what was, needs to be asked of them just so as they're involved in the three you know the, the 360 aspect of it all from start to finish that also gives opportunities for dialogue and for blind spots to be caught um, before you get to a project that's completed and then you go and you take it back to that community and then they're like wait that's you know that's that's not you know that doesn't you know ring true to our community. So I think just um, co-creation and thinking about co-creation on a holistic level, I think is very important for people to consider when working on projects. It's like the old saying, it takes a village to raise a child, right? Exactly. Um, Christina, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, I, I completely agree with everything that the, these women said. And, and I think Gadi was especially um, a, like sensitive and diplomatic in, in in saying that some of the content that's out there doesn't reflect their communities. You know, I, sometimes it's just downright distasteful and really out of touch and out and tone deaf. And it's amazing to think that a room full of executives approve some of this stuff. So um, I think, yeah, I, I just want to throw my my support behind your your idea that you know having having. A writers or at least consultants on any of the you know diverse characters in your scripts um, should be a must. Yeah and so when you said um, a room full of executives you know approving some of the stuff that's can be outright tone deaf how do you deal with that in your own client situations where you might have somebody being tone, like leaning towards you know or, or not really not really caring that much about representing diversity or inclusivity. Um, how do you steer that? It's a really like, tough, it's really tough, Natalie, you know, because I, we are, you know, we are both, we, Metastage has a lot of arms to the company, you know, meaning that, you know, we do original content. Um, we, but then we also are a work for hire, you know, volumetric capture stage. And huh. so, you know, I, there are instances where, frankly, I won't I won't speak up because it's not really my project. This is their you know their script, their their directors. Um, it, I haven't seen any, and I'll admit I haven't seen any flagrant 
acts that were offensive or anything like that. What, what I, I tend to see more of is some of the, the, the women in the hot outfits and the, you know, some of the stuff that's a little eye rolly where you where like someone's a little more sexualized than they need to be. And that again, it's, it's not, I feel like it's not, not my place to step in and say that I think, you know, this is a little bit dated and perhaps, you know, maybe isn't as, um, it, it, you know, might not be as effective with the audience that they're trying to target as they think it would, as, as it will be. Um, I figure, you know, that that's for the, once it gets published, we can then, you know, discuss it as a, as a group and, and, and if people like it, they like it, if they don't, they don't. But if I ever saw anything truly offensive or, or, you know, or inappropriate, of course I would speak up then more at this point, it's more like subtle nuances of taste, I would say. Yeah. What about the rest of you when dealing with clients? Um, would you feel, you know, would you feel compelled to, to speak up and at least, you know, highlight some of the choices being made as tone deaf? Yes, 100%. Um, luckily, we're in a, when we work with clients, because we do original content as well, but um, they, we are really trusted in terms of, we have source content we're working with, but we get to deconstruct it and reconstruct it. And so we do become advocates for some of these um, perspectives that need to be, like, it's, it's not a nice to have. It's like, you need to be looking at this. And so we actually do really get to stand up for that all the time and bake that into the content we're working with. Um, and we just have that the way that we work, we just have that opportunity because we do have source, but we break it apart and we build it back up again. So that's a really nice thing, but we always advocate for the things that we believe in, in terms of the social conversations that need to happen. Some of the subject matter, if there's frameworking on that, that just needs to be part of the conversation. Um, we've had to highlight that because sometimes people will kind of fluff it off, off and be like, oh no, but we're like, we will say, yes, no, you do need to have, like you do need, you do need to talk about this and you do need to um, talk about it in a meaningful way. And so we are able to advocate for those things. Oh, dog. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> no, not now. <laughs> well, you know, it's quarantine life. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's that's super interesting. But I would ask just one more question on that subject matter. Have you had clients actually thank you for pointing some of these things out and, and opening, you know, opening um, opportunities for, for new directions? Or has that not happened yet? Uh, for me, yes. I think our clients really do are very respectful of that and very thankful um, just because we do tend to have, to have our fingers on the pulse of what's happening um, in, so, in social spaces and in terms of those really important humanistic, uh, top, like complex conversations. And so, um, and I think we do have clients that are looking for that modern, fresh perspective and trying to iterate the content into, you know, the new world and, and speak to the perspectives and the things that we need to. So luckily we've had great um, you know, pick up on that and, and great sort of collaboration and co-collaboration in terms of wanting to, to make sure that we do talk about those things. Yeah. Well, let's just hope that clients evolve too. Yes. Right? <laughs> totally. Okay, great. So um, just before we wrap up, I would love to ask a question for the three fifth wave founders in the room. You're all part of the fifth wave initiative. Um, and how... And so have your ideals in terms of how you apply feminist business practices to your companies. How, what is an example of one that you feel is important to your business and decision making? Um, and how does it impact the content you create? Um, okay, I guess I can start. Um, so for us, um, we definitely use an intersectional approach um, so it's um, not just um, feminist practices, but it's feminist and also um, decolonizing at the same time, um, you know, and, um, trying to bring in, you know, a lot of, because I feel like a lot of the feminist practices are, um, do overlap with a lot of um, Indigenous African um, uh, practices as well. So for us, we, we um, have a collective, um, decision making processes a lot we take inputs from a lot of our, um, our our staff members regardless of experience you know everyone's we kind of put all heads together um, you know it's our, our our staff is our village and so we definitely um, have everyone's considerations in mind and then we also just make sure to ensure that on all our productions uh, there are um, uh, women um, uh, or um, women 
women identified non-binary always included in key creative positions um, and you know which is not easy and um, and then also with our uh, emerging filmmakers program we definitely have um, a safe space and um, keep gender parity um, at all times and um, really encourage I think a lot of the of the uh, female members in that program to look at the technical um, positions and the crew positions or positions that are not necessarily traditionally held by women to really kind of, um, you know, encourage that. Yeah, I love the sort of radical inclusivity of your of your approach and, and, and the way that you describe that. Um, Emma and Laura Lee. Yes. Um, for us, it comes to um, our conscious choices, uh, not only like in the inside of our company, like uh, with uh, equal pay and how we uh, like the, um, like all the voices and all the creativity are like valued at the same level and we reach our final goals through discussion and, and teamwork. But uh, also, uh, like I, I mentioned, conscious choices be behind the work we produce and also um, making sure it aligns with our beliefs and our values and also making sure that it will benefit like not only the company, but everyone involved. Like uh, whenever we stage or decide if, if a project is worth to be in, in a specific place, what will be the benefits to the business around it like uh, to the people around it that we're respecting like for example the 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 like the sound or how are we invading their space are we helping are we not helping so all those considerations come into play when we try to figure out that we make uh, something that is coherent go ahead Lorley. Um, awesome. We have a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of the same, um, you know, a lot of the same priorities and focuses in terms of, for me, one of the words that always sticks out in terms of um, something that's really important to me is advocacy. And so that kind of runs across the team um, and the expertise there, especially, um, you know, we work in, in tech and, and dev um, as well as media. And so a lot of the times, you know, we do have a lot of uh, female um, experts and just making sure I'm advocating for them all the time. Um, you know, just in business culture, advocating for the business culture that we want to uh, co-collaborate and collaborate together in that's, you know, uh, inclusive and, and safe for everybody, um, what we work on. So the purpose for sure, advocating for that always. And we will turn down projects. If we call ourselves rebels with the cause. So just really, really leaning into that and knowing that we do care about the output and we do care about the content. So we will say no to stuff if it just doesn't fit that matrix. And that is a collaboration in terms of the team um, and on that together. And so that's sort of, um, that's the thing that always comes up for me is just advocating for the way that we want to work, um, the way that we want to collaborate, um, what we want to work on, um, and also just creating a like, safe, inclusive space for, for the team. Okay, well, that's great. I mean, I think this, this discussion we just had um, touched on so many important things. It takes a village, um, conscious choices, radical inclusivity, taking a humanistic approach, and all of the various formats of immersive media that the four of you all all deliver on. Um, I think the first step is just is just to talk about inclusivity and accessibility and diversity and all those really important things because we need to set the path forward, right? And because it's still in early days, I feel like it's not too late. <laughs> and um, and can be um, the path can still be set. So thank you all of you so much for making the time to talk about this and unpack this with us today. Um, I just want to make a quick announcement to all of you at VRTO to check out the CFC Media Lab um, demo space located in the South Expo Hall. So we have we all um, we we have this space active until the end of VRTO, which is July 6th. Um, that's where we'll be going next. And uh, hopefully all of you here will be joining us there in VR as avatars. <laughs> and uh, where we will also be available for Q&A about the demos. Um, not to mention a very special little digital creative treat, thanks to Laura Lee Sheehan 
here with us who is going to be um, releasing a pre-recorded performance that's exclusive, a musical performance that's exclusive to, to VRTO, to the audience here today. So in the South Expo Hall, we'll be going there next. Um, I think what's following now is a Q&A session in the Discord, in Discord, and then following that South Expo Hall. So see you in VR. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, everyone. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank Hi, you. everybody. It was Thank nice you. to meet you. Okay.